So I will start off the discussion on a lighter note, and I will ask my uh, co-speakers to let us know about their best and not so best experience within arbitral institutions. So Antonio, why don't you start? Sure, um, thanks very much for organizing. Um, so I think uh, my best and worst experiences are, um, you know, two sides of the same coin, and you'll see where I'm going with this, but uh, I think one of the most important aspects of institutions is, of course, the speed at which they, they do things. So, you know, maybe one of the best ones, um, which um, uh, uh, is something actually I didn't expect from that particular institution, um, was when an institution that charges on an ad valorem basis, i.e. it requires uh, the entire advance and cost to be paid uh, initially, uh, when that institution, in fact, was able to proceed with an arbitration, even though not all of the uh, advance and costs had been paid, but only part of it was paid, I thought that was an excellent, um, excellent uh, uh, advantage of that institution uh, over many other institutions, and and that's maybe the other side of that point. You know, some of the worst experiences I have is when it takes potentially four, five, six, nine months uh, for a tribunal to be appointed um, solely because there there's delay on behalf of the institution, or because it is uh, imperative for the institution to obtain the entire advance and costs, uh, and one party is refusing to pay. That in itself causes delay. So I think that you know commencement uh, stage of arbitrations um, can be done either really well or quite poorly. So, you know, some very practical points to start us off. Uh, my comments would be of the same order. Um, I'd say best experiences uh, have been when institutions have been user focused and you, you feel as if you're uh, being taken care of, that uh, you've got great service, uh, it's always terms you, you use a bit cautiously in, in, in our area, but um, yeah, when, when you have an efficient institution and the worst is when on the contrary you have institutions not just being inefficient, but also making mistakes, especially when the parties have said, please do something and then do, do, do right the opposite. Uh, and that's happened in a couple of occasions, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, so that makes me think about like what are the most important jobs that are performed by an arbitral institution. And I will just, before getting to that point, I will also share my experience. And one of my, let's say, not so good experiences was when we did not get the arbitrator with the right qualifications uh, in terms of expertise on the governing law. And my best experience, and that's a continuing one, is the role that the arbitration institutions play in general in thought leadership. And we'll come to thought leadership as we go along in this conversation. But I also want to discuss by like, you know, from leading on from our previous discussion, what do you think are the, let's say, most important jobs that are performed by an arbitral institutions? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you can look at it from uh, the point of what are the most important jobs performed now, um, but it's also interesting to think about what, you know, we would like those jobs to be. <laughs> but yeah, uh, just, just focusing on, on the what, what, what they do now. I mean, from my perspective, the first point I already mentioned, you know, the commencement of the arbitration, that is just something that is absolutely key and it just cannot take a year, you know, it cannot even take three months. It must be something that is done efficiently. Um, so that's one thing. The other very important point is, as you say, arbitrator appointments. I mean, that's obviously absolutely vital. Um, and as everyone knows, can win or lose cases. So yes, um, very, very key. Um, so I think mean, those, those are probably the main ones. I uh, give just a brief other one, I think, review of, uh, of awards. Uh, that can actually be quite a useful tool as well that some of the institutions offer towards the end of the arbitration. Um, so that, those would be my comments on what they do now, but yeah, I have various comments on what they should be doing. <laughs> um, well, to chip in a couple of thoughts. One is, um, I completely agree with Antonia uh, on what she was saying in terms of the time it takes to put together tribunals. And one thing you'll have probably noticed is that when you look at the, the, the statistics of arbitral institutions, and they're talking about how long they it takes for their cases to be resolved, often that 
timeline starts from the point when a tribunal is impaneled, but that's not the full duration of the case. And it's happened way too often in my cases that um, instead of taking a month and a half or maybe two months to get your tribunal in place, you're in six months or maybe more, um, that time is material. The other thing at a broader level about what's beneficial of, or what you might expect of institutions is um, ultimately, if you're using institutional arbitration, it's because you want a safe framework. Uh, you want to be able to not have to think of certain things and have the comfort that the framework is robust, that within it, you can have your arbitration and have a, an enforceable award at the end. Now, obviously, an institution is not responsible for everything, but one of those things is, for example, the scrutiny of rewards, which Antonia mentioned, and uh, more generally, you want a set of rules that is well drafted, that fits well together, so you can go through the whole process and you can give predictability to the parties. Yeah, so I think that that is uh, like a number of things that uh, are being like, raised here. So let's start discussing some of these things one by one. So my own opinion is that one of, if you have to really zero in and it's very difficult and I think it's also reductionist in a way to zero in on one aspect, but if you have to zero in on one aspect, I think which is the most crucial one uh, and one of the most important roles that, are, that is played by an arbitral institution in the present day and age is the appointment of an arbitrator, especially where the parties uh, are not in agreement over let's say a sole arbitrator uh, in, a, in a dispute. And that I think perhaps can really, I mean, any council can, can state that, can have a very important impact on the quality or your experience with that arbitration. Um, so, and, and that's a very, I would say it's not, a, it's not a easy topic because I mean, there are a number of things, number of initiatives that are being led at the same, like at, at the moment uh, around the world. So for example, there is a greater push towards diversity in the arbitral appointments, there is also a greater push towards the transparency in the arbitral appointments. So what are your thoughts about some of these things, especially from the perspective of arbitral appointments, but these are the topics that also relate to other areas, for example, the quality of the arbitral award or the innovation and technology aspect of resolution of the dispute. So we'll come to that, but let's say in terms of the arbitral appointments, especially from uh, the Diversity, diversity perspective and the transparency perspective. So what are your thoughts on, on, on these uh, issues? Yeah, I mean, these are very loaded issues, as you say, that, 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 that they're all very much connected. And um, uh, I, I think, you know, we, we kind of need to be looking at the future on this topic because there's so much that can be done there and, and, and arbitrators. We've got fantastic initiatives now, as you say, with diversity, you know, being pushed, which I think the institutions are actually doing really well. Uh, most of them are signing up uh, to the pledge. Uh, the numbers are going up every year, um, and, th and that's you know at least at least the gender diversity is being addressed to some extent. Obviously, there are other diversity issues as well. Um, but there's also, of course, generally a push for transparency in terms of arbitrator intelligence, um, uh, and that is also I think uh, connected to this. So yes, what I would you know this is I guess one of the topics where what, what I would like to see institutions do is um, have a transparent uh, approach towards arbitrator appointments that uses the available information and technology, um, you know, that allows uh, arbitrators to potentially, you know, submit their CVs so that the information that, uh, that is necessary on the website, potentially use some form of technology or AI that, you know, reviews all of the submissions for each particular case, depending on certain search criteria that the institution had put in, and basically takes out some of the human factor out of the initial shortlisting. Uh, of course, obviously the human factor is vital for the arbitrator at home, and I'm not saying you know, they should do this with technology only, but I do think that if you take out the human factor out of the, let's say, you know, top 20 candidate shortlist, um, then you'll end up having um, a much wider selection of options that actually fit the particular case um, more specifically because you can potentially tick, you know, that they have the expertise, uh, whether it's sector or legal expertise that you want, and then they'll come up, um, whereas, you know, otherwise the particular person uh, with the uh, appointing authority may, may, may not have that person in mind. So, you know, yeah, th this is how I would like uh, to see this area develop. 
I'm very keen to hear your thoughts on this. So, Hafiz, why don't you go first, and then I'll, I'll also share my thoughts on this. I was actually going to suggest the other way around, since I've got my institutional yeah. hat, then I can take notes about what, what you would like, and then I can see what, what I can offer. <laughs> yeah, so I'm thinking, like, from, from my perspective, I think, I mean, one of the things that that is, I think, of critical importance uh, when we're talking about diversity initiatives and the appointments by the arbitral institutions is transparency by arbitral institutions. And... I mean, the good encouraging thing is that a lot of arbitrators are, uh, arbitration institutions are in fact, uh, you know, very transparent in terms of sharing the appointments, which also indicates the dismal position actually, in terms of the gender disparity, the regional disparity and the cultural disparity uh, that there is. I mean, I was just looking at some of the figures earlier today and in some institutions, like only one fifth of the arbitral appointments are, women, which I don't think is a is like from any stretch of imagination is a good number. So, but I think these two issues are in a way closely tied. And, and there has been a historical criticism of uh, the old boys club in the arbitral institution, which can only in a way be dissipated through greater push towards transparency. And I think transparency indeed is the right check on, on arbitral institutions so far, insofar as the check is needed uh, by the consumers so that they can select more carefully uh, an arbitral institution which in fact is aligned with their own goals and with their own pledges uh, as, as Antonia indicated. So there's quite a lot of food for thought in all that. Um, maybe as a starting point, um, I agree with you that um, institutions should, uh, should put out there how they go about choosing arbitrators. Uh, there's only so much, so you can only get so specific about um, those sort of um, criteria just because part of it is case dependent, but there is a certain amount you can say. And to my knowledge, uh, Delos and the SCC are the only two institutions to do so. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, now, and it's on our, on our, on our website. Now, then to follow on with something that Antonia was saying about um, the use of tech and AI, I think maybe one way to look at it is if you think of the whole process of arbitrator selection, one way, so you can frame it as you've got a human element in all of it, but if you really break it down, the human element, the added value of the human element is only maybe say 40% or 30% meaning everything else is mechanical. And at that point, there is really no reason why in the future, there may not be uh, a tech or AI uh, solution that helps you filter potential arbitrators as uh, Antonia was saying and pull up uh, a good shortlist. Now, the prerequisite to that is having a database of potential arbitrators. So people need to indicate their interest and willingness to serve as arbitrators. Um, and here, just as a bracket, people can do so on, our web, on the Delos website if they wish to. Um, but then you also need fields that are, or to, you also need to capture information in a way that is detailed and um, systematic enough so that you're, you've got a, a good combination between your database and then the reality of your cases that inevitably is going to take time to find the right solution. So there will inevitably, if that's the way of the future, there'll inevitably be a period of transition where mm -hmm. you graduate, you're doing both until you feel that the results of the tech and AI are getting you where you need to be. But I think the single biggest positive of doing that is it avoids the far from sight, far from mind uh, phenomenon. Um, and that then takes me to the diversity point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the two, the two parts of the conversation on diversity, one is the quality of decision-making. Um, and that's what uh, you were saying, Omer. But I think the other is, if you look at the statistics in terms of arbitrator appointments, for sole arbitrators, about 70, 80% is by the institution. Um, if you look at the statistics of the ICC and the LCIA, for example, but for three member tribunals, the statistics typically reversed. And so 
for three member tribunals, it really is for parties and their clients to lead the way. But for sole arbitrators, it's for the institutions to do so. And as a discourse, the institutions should be at the forefront of discussions on this uh, as role models and from the point of view of thought leadership. And I'm yeah. ha happy to develop that, but I, I'm aware of what you said quite a lot. No, I mean, I agree with all of that. And, uh, but I think, uh... Obviously, parties learn about arbitrators to some extent from you know those arbitrators that grow with institutions. I mean, I think most of us know that the junior arbitrators only really get appointed by institutions or primarily get appointed by institutions to start off. So it is very much in the institutions' um, hands to you know help with at least uh, age diversity <laughs> um, and and to give you know young arbitrators uh, their their first appointment. So. So yeah, and hopefully that you know trickles through on 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 the party appointed side as well. Yeah, so I mean, I also like you know uh, share 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 these thoughts. So at the end of the day, it seems like it's a very complicated process, right? So we're uh, at the same time there, like the transparency can be improved with the inclusion of technology by adding the right filters, right? So like taking out the human agency. But at the same time, since there is a human agency involved in the appointment of arbitrators, there has to be certain clear set of criteria and guidelines, which uh, can be transparently, you know, one can say uploaded on the arbitral institution's website, shared with the users, shared with the council, that can be employed. And that one can, as, as, as a council who like is, is advising on an arbitration agreement, uh, one can say that one can assess whether these guidelines are in line with the broader uh, diversity objectives that we're just uh, discussing, right? Yeah, I can yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, I, I completely agree with Antonia as well that uh, especially for first appointments, it's for institutions to lead the way. Um, they know the market, they can take risks in a way that it's a lot harder for parties and uh, clients to do. Um, so it, it's on them and uh, that's something that you can't be an institution and not embrace that. Just um, a, a question for you two. Um, do you think at some point institutions will rely on, you know, or, or, or at least review the various databases that are being delivered like uh, arbitrary intelligence on arbitrator uh, information, but also we've got GAR art and you know, various other um, arbitrator interviews that are going on. I mean, uh, will, will there be a time where part of this transparent process will be for an institution to check how a particular arbitrator performed and you know, has been uh, reviewed on these various um, you know, websites? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm tempted to use the, the lawyer answer, which is it depends. Uh, and it depends in the particular case of who's appointing. But I think what institutions definitely can do is give visibility to, um, to practitioners who are less well known, uh, but who are solid nonetheless to give them opportunities to uh, meet and connect with other practitioners. Because a lot of um, the reality of uh, a lot of how arbitrator appointments take place is uh, who do you trust uh, or who uh, do you know enough for a particular case because you've seen them work, you've seen their, you've interacted with them and so on. So the more you can create points of contact uh, with diverse people, the more you give opportunities to those people as well. I think I think there will be a time when I think these tools will become prevalent enough and will be used uh, common like you know used used a lot by by the council and users of arbitration, so that there will be a push I think for the arbitral institutions as well to have a look at them review them in the course of uh, appointment of arbitrators. So I think that I mean I I, th I think that is also a general push towards using these kind of tools which you know through technology aggregate information data and present it. And I think there will be a push towards that as well. And I just want to ask, like, uh, like put in one more question and just move to another theme altogether, which is 
about, unless there are any comments about what we were discussing already, which is about the cost aspect of, uh, of the arbitration. Now, like, I mean, I, I was just going through, as I said, like and, and when we were talking earlier, uh, going through the FAQs on uh, Delos's website. And one of the things that Delos makes very clear that is that it's sort of low cost alternative or a low cost arbitral institution, but it nevertheless tries to contain time and cost. And now, according to the information that is there in the FAQs, 80% of the cost of an arbitration is the lawyer's fee, which I think we are not going to discuss at the moment. But uh, so, so 80% of that is that, and only 20% of the arbitrations are, is, is the fee of the arbitral institution. But as lawyers, we usually like to you know, scrutinize that area more, which is the 20%. But I think that is still, I think, very important to emphasize that the arbitral institution, and that is something that is there to, I'd, I'd say, I would say, there to forget about an arbitral, arbitral institution is that it's not a, it, it can contain costs by actively involving itself in the arbitration proceedings or by, by using innovative means uh, for, uh, for conducting the arbitration. Uh, but it's looking at it as a low cost alternative in and, of, on, in and of itself, perhaps may not be the right approach. So any thoughts, thoughts on that? Um, certainly, the, I'm always a bit uh, nervous when I hear low cost because people tend to quick, uh, to have a mental shortcut to low quality and, and one thing we can discuss, uh, and I'm happy to do so, is the time, cost, quality triangle. Um, but as far as Delos is concerned, we believe we've optimized all three. Now, when you're thinking about cost, um, so 80% we said was the lawyers, 20% is arbitrators and institution. You, it's not a conversation you can have in abstract. and. If you forgive the background noise, um, sorry. Um, if you, it, it, these are not conversations we often have in arbitration, but I think it's difficult to have a conversation about costs without also having a market conversation. And the market conversation is the following, which is, sorry, I've got a fire truck going past uh, the joys of uh, working uh, remotely. It's so realistic. I thought it was next to my house. <laughs> <laughs> So when, you th when you're looking at it from a market perspective, what you see is that up to a certain level of uh, amount in dispute, you've got a greater supply of quality arbitrators, including arbitrators that are much less well-known but are very competent. And that takes us back to the diversity conversation um, and an undersupply of cases. Now, you want to remunerate fairly your arbitrators, but what you can also do is possibly pay them a bit less um, because that allows you to have costs that are more proportionate to the amount in dispute. And the relevance of that is if you look at the fee schedules of a number of institutions, they'll say they, they cater for cases starting from zero value, but the the minimum amount you need to spend on institutional and arbitrator fees effectively is a barrier to entry for the very small, uh, small value cases. And so if you want a more proportionate fee schedule, you need to be a bit more realistic about what the market is at that level. Conversely, at a much higher level uh, of amount in dispute, if you want time efficiency, you can't tell a leading arbitrator today, we're going to pay you the same, but we're going to ask you to do a lot more work in just a lot less time. The economics don't work. And so past a certain amount, you need to pay arbitrators more actually to gain in efficiency and to gain in cost overall. Uh, but again, that's a market conversation. And because we're talking about the 20% that are left, increasing that amount or decreasing, it doesn't have a huge impact in abstract, but in practical terms, it's a difference in terms of access to justice for smaller value cases and time efficiency for higher value cases. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think, you know, that's a smart institution will be thinking in those ways. Uh, and you're absolutely right. There are arbitrators that will accept less than the current minimum scales. 
um, because they want to build up their experience. And um, yes, there should be there, there should be some form of uh, you know particularly small fee that is uh, available um, for let's you know let's say the smaller um, expedited proceedings that are you know under one or two million dollars completed within three to six months. Um, as you say, there's a barrier to entry, and exactly as you say, um, the costs for those are just too high to even attempt to recover your dues, and that's just not right. Um, so I absolutely agree on that on that side of uh, of the arbitration. Something needs to be done. Um, and similarly, yeah, exactly as you say on the other side. So I fully agree. Um, I, I um, in terms of sort of Umar, what you were saying earlier about you know how what can be done to improve on costs. Um, uh, without the proceedings, um, I, I wonder whether uh, this is what's going to be happening in the next 10 years or so, but uh, at least what I would like to see is uh, for institutions to have um, smart arbitrations. So, and, and I think that this is something that goes to cost uh, and could uh, really reduce the cost to some extent um, and also just assist the whole process that arbitrates of the parties. But I would like to see something where institutions um, you know, use technology to take into account the rules, the procedural order, terms of reference, and even maybe the mandatory law, um, sorry, not the mandatory law, the procedural law of the siege, mandatory law, I'm, I'm, I'm still divided on whether that should also, but uh, obviously without uh, giving legal advice, but simply to take into account these uh, various procedural requirements, um, put them into a technology and spit them out um, whenever the you know the steps need to be completed and give the information um, to to the parties and I think that would really save a lot of time on the arbitrator side but also on the party side especially for parties that are potentially not represented um, or, or or you know where counsel is not as experienced. Um, I, I, I really think that could, um, you know, that could be something that, that it could be done and I could actually end up saving costs by taking some of the basic uh, procedural aspects out of, um, you know, at the moment, they're only really with an arbitrator control and, and arbitrators are in, inherently busy. Um, so often these kind of issues end up being completely uncontrolled <laughs> and, and simply slip, slip uh, through the cracks. So yeah, uh, I, I hope I'm not too many years ahead of, of myself, but uh, some ideas about costs. Yeah, and I think there are there is like since because there are a lot of arbitration institutions that have emerged during the last I would say ten years uh, during the last decade. So there has been a push I think towards coming up with new and innovative models amongst the arbitral institutions. And there is a desire to lead the way, which I think is really useful for arbitration practitioners, counsel and parties. And I would just highlight in, in the passing two areas, which I think have been the most remarkable uh, in terms of procedural innovation. Number one is the expedited arbitral proceedings. Number two is the emergency arbitration, which I believe both, both, both these uh, procedural innovations came up in the last 10 or 15 years. And they have been instrumental uh, in, in the in the acceptance and use of arbitration and the popularity of arbitration amongst the parties. But I think the desire for innovation does not really stop here. And I and I think and I've experienced that that some of the arbitral institutions do nudge the arbitrator or at least like you know bring it to their attention to decide things this way or that way. So, for example, one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the points in nearly all uh, arbitral rules of arbitral institutions is the holding of procedural meetings and these measures. So there can be, let's say, along with these measures, be ideas about uh, holding of, let's say, meetings to discuss technology and all that, and how the process can be made more efficient and better through the active use of technology. And as you said, like right now, uh, after the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, it's really in the control of the arbitrators. Now, some of the arbitrators have uh, very easily accepted it. And I think I usually place people in two categories when it comes to use of technology in the pandemic. So now one are like in one category are the people who have accepted it wholeheartedly. They have they love cross-examination on, on, on Zoom. They, they really like the idea of uh, you know online headings. And then there is another set of people. Uh, and unfortunately, there may be a generational gap here. Uh, who still have a problem, uh, you know, with the, with the use of technology and they think, you know, they use it, but there is an inherent 
uh, unreliability about how things will go online. So, but I think moving forward, I would say that the arbitral institutions perhaps will be, or will have to play, I think, a greater role in terms of uh, use of technology. And I like it how, like the different things that we're discussing right now are all interconnected because technology is connected with cost, uh, you know, and, uh, and cost is then associated with also, just like you said, with diversity. So all of these issues become a complex interconnection of different sub issues, which is quite interesting. So how is your thoughts? Maybe. Um, I mean, I was listening to you and I was thinking, yeah, that, that, that it, I definitely agree that it's, um, so there's a lot of thought right now about tech and about what shape um, or how institutions should engage with tech. Um, it's difficult to say specifically what that will look like, um, but I think we can confidently say that within the next five, 10 years, most of our cases will be run through online platforms, that um, hearings will, depending on their length, the, how much is at stake, uh, the number of witnesses and parties and so on, may quite routinely take place remotely. I'm pretty sure now that CMCs will um, actually be held by video as opposed to by phone. Um, and same for terms of reference meetings, for example, they won't be held in person anymore. Uh, but conversely, I think significant merit hearings will still take place in person. Um, but then they may not take place in person as we were used to seeing them. It may be that uh, we have greater use of hybrid proceedings and related to that as well, um, and, and here I'm going to sort of diversify the, the topic a bit, but um, with more geographical flexibility, I think we're also going to have more uh, players enter the market from a council perspective, because historically council have been participating in arbitration from a local, regional, and sometimes international point of view. But it's not, you've not necessarily had um, boutique firms competing on a global market. Um, and to tie this back to the institutional conversation, and if we're projecting forward, um, I think institutions are going to have to make a strategic choice as to whether they're local, regional, or whether they're international. And if they're international, then they can't just be talking to the well-known players, they need to talk to everyone because uh, competency is, uh, is there um, in many different shapes and forms. Yeah, and I mean, when it comes to talking to everyone, I like, would just like to highlight, I mean, the new technological platforms that have emerged in the last, you know, uh, since March uh, due to COVID-19. We are having this conversation. I'm sitting in Pakistan, in Tony and Dubai. Half is you in uh, Paris, Olan? I'm in Paris right now. Paris. Oh, yeah. So we are having this conversation, like, you know, from in different parts of the world. So I, I would say that I would think that, you know, these, the lessons, or at least lessons that we've learned during the last, uh, you know, a couple of months will be remembered as we move on. So Antonia, you wanted to say something? Yeah, well, um, slightly on topic, slightly moving to a different topic, but on, on the point of, uh, you know, you're sitting on different locations and, and you know, how, how much you're talking about you know, more technology, more virtual um, arbitration offerings. Um, one complaint or question that I get from clients um, a lot is, where is my institution? Um, I don't want my institution to be in Paris. Um, I would like my institution to be, you know, wherever the client is. And um, I, you know, try and explain that really uh, the institutions are global and um, especially with all the technology and everything that's available, uh, it actually doesn't matter if an institution has a base um, in Paris um, or wherever the office is. But there, there is still, you know, that, that this is still an issue. And I know from the institutions having spoken to various people that it, this is why institutions open offices elsewhere, because um, there is that perception that unless the institution is where the client is, the client will sign up to another institution. So do you too think we are moving to some form of virtual institution that maybe won't have a location anymore to try and avoid this issue because it's you know simply impractical and actually in my mind view not necessary to open up offices in every single place 
um, when um, you know that's uh, there's no you know it really is just a waste of money um, to have an office in every single uh, place in which you could have a, a arbitration. Uh, yes, you know some offices make sense. Of course, I'm not you know entirely against the concept, but um, yeah, this is something I was wondering: are, are we potentially moving to some sort of virtual institution? Yeah, I would just, uh, I mean, I would just echo firstly, like your observation that, you know, I, like I've had the same experience. So I have, in my experience from the feedback that I've received from my clients, there is a general imagination or an idea that institutions are tied with any geographical location. Now, the part of the reasons I think is that that particular geographical location is a part of the institution's name. So there is a London Code of International Arbitration, there is Singapore International Arbitration, Hong Kong International Arbitration. So that the institution itself, in a way, tie themselves with a particular location by by that particular branding choice, if I use if I may use that term. Mm. And then there is like through like an, an idea of that wherever the head of the head head office of the institution is located, that's where the institution is uh, is actually located. That's where the ground like institutions are. So if you're picking, for example, London as the seat of arbitration, then you know you will pick LCIA, right? If 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 uh, you're not better advised, or for any, any for, for or or you will not look at other institutions. That's what I meant. So so that there is that idea. Uh, you know, I think that I've also like, like witnessed. But that is a strange, like quite strange because I mean, you whenever you have to interact with an institution in anywhere in the world, like what you usually used to do, like before COVID nineteen, before people started working from home, is to pick up the phone and give them a call. And it doesn't really matter where you are in, in which part of the world you are, because you will still, even if you're in London, you will pick up the phone and call the institution, right? So I think a part of it is, is I think it is broadly uh, or fundamentally psychological. I think there is this idea that, that institutions are tied with some geography. And I think that also, I think is tied with the title of our discussion. Now, this is something I feel is so, something that has to be forgotten about an arbitral institution, that it is tied with any Geography, even if that geographic geographic location is part of the of the name of the arbitral institution, and I think the arbitral institutions are themselves ad actively advocating to defeat this impression. But this impression somehow has held, and I think you confirm that I have also had the same experience. Uh, I confirm it too. I mean, the I think the three geographical um, pinpoints, as it were, that uh, that are tro troubling are the, when it's in the name of the institution. Um, clients and sometimes even counsel uh, struggling with the difference between seat and venue or seat and place of meetings and hearings and um, relatedly between seat and institution. So there's often a mental shortcut done by uh, certain categories of parties that arbitration in Singapore means arbitration at the Singapore International Arbitration Center. Um, and it's a great center, but the two aren't necessarily linked. Um, and then you've got the third question, which is, and, and this takes us yet in a different direction, is um, when people are having conversations about, okay, but how do we develop the operation market locally, um, trying to be everything for everyone at once, when actually you could focus on one aspect, such as uh, being the place where hearings and meetings are held, um, as distinct from being a safe seat or from being uh, one of many uh, new institutions that nobody's ever heard of. Um, I'm being slightly cynical, but I'm going back to what Umer was saying that there's been a mushrooming of institutions in recent years. And uh, I think the UAE may be a good example of that. Yeah, so I, uh, we are already 40 minutes into the conversation. I was thinking that perhaps it's, it's a good time to wrap up the conversation. So. And, and while we are going towards the closure of our, our discussion, uh, I just want to like discuss like what we might want in future, you know, and bearing in mind that the last couple of months have been a very disruptive for perhaps like for each of us, I'm sure, and have been very disruptive for the world in general, very disruptive for, disruptive for all businesses, including uh, arbitral institutions. Uh, what, what would you think that some of the features, let's say, that have emerged, let's say, in the last uh, couple of months during the pandemic, or uh, would like, you know, you would say you would prescribe otherwise that we'd want uh, in the future uh, that should be taken up by the arbitral institutions? Let me start this off. I mean, I think I already shared lots of my um, uh, 
delusions about uh, the future of institutions. But uh, one more practical uh, idea about, uh, well, hope, I guess, um, wearing my um, green arbitrations hat. Um, I, I do really hope that uh, this year will not be the only year that uh, arbitrations have become greener. Um, and I think um, as part of the Green Arbitrations campaign, we're actually working at the moment right now on um, some various protocols that we want institutions in various other stakeholders um, to, uh, to review and be guided by for the future to ensure that we save on all the printing and, and as much as possible of the travel and so on and so on, because um, in arbitrations are so environmentally unfriendly. Um, that, um, yeah, my, my hope is that there will be a real push going forward um, to, to try and be more environmentally friendly and take all, all of the uh, big wins of this year, in that sphere at least, into account um, going forward. Um, and basically not just go back to where we were uh, last year with, you know, even uh, various CMCs being done in person when, you know, there, there is just no need for that. I think pretty much everyone agrees on that nowadays. <laughs> so, so yeah. So that's that's my hope um, uh, for the future, and I hope that the yeah, institutions will, you know, adapt their own guidelines. Um, and uh, what I also would like to see, and this is also something that we're doing as part of the campaign, uh, that institutions encourage parties and arbitrators to be greener as well. Um, and for that purpose, uh, I want to see you know, protocols that are being sent to parties and arbitrators, the beginnings of arbitrations, so that they can also be aware of the types of things they can do to be greener. Um, and um, yeah, so th th those, uh, those are my, uh, my parting comments on, on that topic. <laughs> so green, definitely. I think what I'd, um, what I'd say is we've, there's been a lot of gain made this year in powering down to what was to, to what is really meaningful. One of the things we said was, um, to what extent does a physical location matter? And I think part of the learnings of 2020 has been, what can we forget about uh, or what is secondary? And what I'd like is that those learnings are, are kept. Uh, just on that, on the, one of the last points that Antonia mentioned, uh, uh, in our fee schedule, um, the expenses of arbitrators are included in their fees. In other words, if they want to travel, it's up to them, but um, they have an incentive to reduce their own expenses because that comes out of their fees. Good. Yeah, I, but I, I would also add to this list, uh, Greener definitely, and I think uh, the, the innovation in terms of technology, again, I think will perhaps be an integral part as, as Hafid also discussed earlier, I think we will see more hybrid processes in, in the future. And I will also highlight one other part that I at least would want to see like uh, be kept or maintained in the future, which is the uh, uh, thought leadership initiatives and the way in which they were conducted uh, during the uh, pandemic. And as we have seen like the, the, the amount of discussion, the amount of discourse that happened during the last couple of few years, even though there were like restrictions on traveling, the social events could not be organized in the same way. And although it's very, it's imperative, I guess, for people to meet. But at the same time, I think the, the way in which discussions are being held and the way in which the discussions are being preserved uh, for, for references in future as well. I think that is something that as far as I'm concerned that I would want to see in the future uh, as well. And I think that will also solve a number of problems related to, again, like just like I said, all of these issues are, are interconnected, but it will also solve, address a number of issues related to diversity, regional di diversity, cultural diversity. And I think even after the pandemic is over and the, and the, and the regional uh, or the travel restrictions are lifted, the discussions that such as the one we are having right now would still be held, and at least if they're not held, like there will be at least an online recording of, of, the, of the discussions there, so that you know that this discourse or discussion you know can be can be preserved, and exist, uh, which is something that I would I would think that I would like to see see maintained in the future as well. Yeah, and to both of your points, I think one of the things that's been great is because now everybody's comfortable with doing uh, video uh, meetings. You don't have to travel 
to connect with friends in Dubai and Pakistan, uh, just to take this one example. And that is environmentally friendly and it's better for, and, and it's good to stay in touch and be able to keep up and exchange ideas. And I think that to your point, uh, Umer, it will help as well in the flow of ideas. Yeah, thank you, Hafiz. Antonia, any thoughts on that before we uh, close the discussion? Yeah, I think yeah, I think you've squared the circle there. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah, it's uh, completely agree and uh, very much look forward to more of these. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, Antonia, thank you, Hafiz, for joining us, uh, joining me in this discussion, and thank you, everyone, for who's watching uh, this this uh, Facebook Live video. Uh, this was one of the first Facebook Live videos that Delos uh, is participating in. And the first, right? <laughs> yeah. And we thought we might just before, you know, and, and there is already good news uh, in the media about the vaccine. So before the pandemic is over and the, and the restrictions are lifted, uh, I thought it would be a good idea for Delos to have at least one online uh, Facebook discussion. Mm -hmm. And we'll have more of the, these in the future as well. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. And have a good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.